Amen. Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Um, and afterward, Moses went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you to your burdens? Verse 5, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw themselves. And the tail of the bricks which they did make before, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein. And let them not regard vain words. The word of God for the people of God. Father in heaven, we thank you today, Lord God, for this opportunity that you've given us once again to come before you, God, and to sing praise unto your wonderful name, to give to you out of what you have entrusted us with, and now to hear your life-transforming word. We ask that you would cause every distraction to be pushed aside. And Father, cause our focus and attention to be upon you. And we do ask you today to give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us, Lord. We pray that you would enlighten the understanding of our hearts. Give us courage and wisdom, Lord God, to apply your word to our lives, that your name might be glorified by our living. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. God was executing his call on Israel to go out and to be his people. They had been enslaved in Egypt. We, uh, most of us are pretty familiar with the story. And Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. God had um, called Moses and told him, Look, I want you to send you to Pharaoh and uh, you're going to tell him, let my people go. And Moses was a little worried about that. You know, he said, Look, I'm, I'm slow of speech and I don't know, you know, they, they ain't going to believe me. But God convinced uh, Moses to go. And he sent his brother Aaron with him. And so they get to Pharaoh and they you know, tell Pharaoh what God said. He let my people go. And to no surprise, Pharaoh resisted and tried to make things a little bit harder on him for even thinking about that. We read in verse 9, he's like, let them have more work because they're idle. That way they won't be having, listening to all these vain words. He wanted to get their minds off of God's, of what God's word said and off the calling that God had on their life. So I want to talk about answering the call because God has a call for us. Um, and I want to talk to two particular things. I want to talk about it. Um, but one, one thing in general is that the call of God is challenging. It is challenging. When God puts a call in your life, it is challenging. I can remember hearing a guy uh, was talking about um, someone saying how, um, I bet, you know, now that you're, give, you know, as you're giving your life to Christ, uh, you know, the, you know the, everything's become easier. There's no more challenges, no more difficulties. He said, man, I hadn't seen challenges until I started trying to live for God because now you got to fight against the flesh, which I never fought against. Right? I went with my flesh. Whatever I felt like, I did it. I was gratified and satisfied. Now you got to fight against the flesh. You got the devil and you got the, you got the, you got the systems of the world. And so in, in that sense, it gets really challenging. Um, and so it's challenging because it requires change. Now, when God calls you, God is not calling you to whatever you are, to, to wherever you are, whatever you are. It's always something different. It's always a change. Called Abraham, you know, hey, leave your country. I want you to go out to where I'm going to tell you to go, right? He, the call of God is, is challenging because it requires change, right? And so the definition that we're going to use for change is um, change is that to, to cause to be different. Two things, because both of these are important. That's why I chose these two definitions to use. And something that corrects an error. 
that car God calls us to be different. And then change is also something that corrects an error. You know, you got something wrong, you make a change because you're going to correct an error. So two of those things is what we're going to keep in mind. So Israel was enslaved. They were enslaved to Egypt, but their calling was to be free. They were God's people. They were, they, their calling was to be free, but yet they were enslaved. So if they were going to be able to walk in their calling, there would have to be a, a change. There would have to be a change, but as we see, and that's what God was executing here, a change, but we also see that immediately we see it's challenging. It was challenging. The thought of it was challenging to Moses. Like, who am I, how, can, how am I going to go tell Pharaoh this is the most powerful man in the world, and I'm going to tell him, let his labor force go, because you, you, God said let him go. Moses said he could kill me on the spot. The, God, the call of God was immediately challenging. But the call of God is always to something different, right? It's always to something different, a different lifestyle, a different usefulness. You know, we talked about this a, a week or so ago, uh, mentioned how Paul said, look, that told the Romans that at one time they were presenting themselves as instruments of unrighteousness. So now you got to present yourselves as instruments of righteousness. That, uh, that be before God calls us, we are used, our body, our, our, our bodies, our minds, our thoughts and attitudes, it is used for unrighteousness. And that's just the way it is. And Jesus says that, you know, we need to be born again so that we can use our, our, ourselves, our lives and all that we are for instruments of righteousness, to execute the righteousness of God. And so he, but he has to call us. And that's what he calls us to. You know, whenever you, if you say I've answered the call of God, then what you are saying is there is a change, right? And, and it's not a small change, but it is a great change. It is a great change. So there are two particular calls that God sends out to men. One that corrects an error. This is the call to come to Christ. Because, because before I came to Christ, I am living in error, right? Old folks used to call it living in sin. I'm living in error because I am living and, and my life is not surrendered to Christ. I am not reconciled to God and therefore I am, I, I am in error. And what he calls me to is to come to Christ to be born again so that I can no longer, to, to correct the error, to change. To change my position in God, my position before God. Right. Sometimes people think we can just, you know, you hear people talk about good works, bad works and my good deeds. I weigh my bad deeds and all that. But what God calls us to is to have a different relationship with him, a relationship where he says that I will be your God and you will be my my people. That change in relationship. He calls us to correct the error of the uh, of our position with him, because once we sin, we we were in a bad position with God. We were, in a, we were on the wrong side of God. You saw it in, in the book of Genesis, right? When Adam and Eve, they, God come down in the cool of the day and he's fellowshipping with them and talking with them. And then when they sin, the relationship changed, but didn't change for the better. It changed for the worse. God came down, now they're hiding because they are now in sin. And ever since then, men have been in sin and we've had, always had to be called back to a right relationship with God. And so because sin, sin, messed our relationship with God up and caused us to have an erroneous or a relationship with God that was in error, that we weren't on his good side. And what Jesus comes to do in the uh, first Corinthians 15 says that Jesus is the new Adam, the second Adam, shall I say, and he comes to correct that error. And so he says, even so as all in Adam, in, in Adam all die in Christ, all shall live. And so we, he calls all of us to be corrected in our relationship to him. And that starts by surrendering to God. Sometimes when we um, sing certain songs uh, and if there's a song about you, like I give myself away or something, whatever it is, you know, I intentionally, when I, when I raise my hands, I intentionally don't raise them like this. I raise them like this. You know why? Because this to me is a position of surrender. Right. If, you know, if, if, if somebody pulls the gun on you, put your hands up, you don't do it like that. You, well, it's like this. Right. And you see him on TV and the old cowboy movies. The sheriff pulls the gun. And this is I give up. I give in. And so a lot of times when we are singing certain songs and it's talking about surrendering and giving it all to God, I intentionally lift my hands this way because I want to remind myself that I have to constantly give in and surrender to God. I have to constantly do it, but there has to also have been that first time when I did it, when I surrendered, not just the situation, but my life. Because that's the call of God, to surrender your life 
to him to correct that error. So we're no longer in a bad relationship, but we have a good relationship with God. And then after that, the second aspect of the call, the second call is a call to some type, to some type of service. Right, some type of service. And, you know, and sometimes people try to get the cart before the horse. Like, I wonder what God wants to use me for. First, you got to surrender. First, you got to have the, that proper relationship with him before he could ever use you. Right. So there has to be a surrendering. And so that's why, you know, there should be a time in your life where, you know, it was this day. It was this month or whatever it was that I surrendered to the Lord. And you begin to walk with him and then. He calls you to some type of service. But every service that God, God calls us to is going gonna, is gonna to require improvement. Right? You're going to have to get, when God calls you to something, believe me, you're going to have to improve in order to accomplish that. Right? Before I could ever preach, I had to, I had to improve. Right? I, look, I surrendered my life to the Lord, but by no means was I ready to get up and start teaching the word of God. I had to get better. I had to improve. I, 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 had to, I had to improve and, and there had to be more change that happened in my life. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this and I said, you know what? The only areas of your life that doesn't need to be changed, that doesn't need to improve, are the areas that are already, the areas that are already perfected. Huh? So what does that say? You got any areas in your character that are perfect? I know I don't have any in mine. So I know that I constantly am in need of change. Becoming different and correcting errors in my life. So here it is, guys. When God was ready to increase Israel's usefulness, his first call is going to correct the error of their environment. And in, in, in verse 3, he said, The God of the Hebrews met with us and said, Let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to our Lord. He said, God said, I want you to tell Pharaoh, you got to let you go because you got to get out of that environment. Right. Why, why, why couldn't God he, he just uh, let him serve him right there and just go be his people right there or whatever? He said certain environments you got to got to get away from. And so he was going to correct the error of their environment. Right. You see, the company you keep can, will impact your usefulness for God for either good or bad. You hear what I'm saying to you? The company that you that you habitually keep will impact your usefulness to God for either good or bad. I'll show you a few scriptures to help you up to help uh, make this point. First Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Right. Don't let, you know, don't let nobody fool you. Don't get it twisted. It's a filthy communication. Bad company ruins good morals. That's what God says. Who am I to say? Nah, but it ain't gonna happen to me. I'm different. No, you're human, right? And you got something inside of you that's chomping at the bit for, uh, for bad. And the company you keep can bring it out. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, yeah. right? Yeah. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. First we saw bad company ruins good morals. Right. Now we see that in the positive side of it, iron sharpens iron. As iron sharpens iron, a person can help another one to be better. Your usefulness to God will be impacted by the company that you keep, by your environment, either for good or for bad. Let me share, share one more scripture with you. Proverbs thirteen twenty. He that walks with wise men shall be wise. Why? So that company he keeps is going to impact him for good. But the companion of fools, the company he keeps is going to impact him for, for bad. But the company, it said the, the companion of fools shall be sure. When God was ready to increase Israel's usefulness, the first thing he was going to do is correct the error of their environment. So y'all in the wrong place. Anybody? I know God has corrected the error of my environment right out the gate. It's like, okay, no, you don't go here no more. No, you can't go there. You know, you need to stop going over here. Because God knows that that filthy communications corrupt good manners, that 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 people rub off on people. Right? Parents have understood this for, for, since the dawn of time, right? That if you hang that that if my child hangs with the wrong crowd, it could be bad for him. Parents, don't, parents normally don't just let their children hang with anybody they want to because they understand that, that 
people uh, rub off on people. As the old saying says, association brings simulation, right? The more God changes you, the more useful you become to him. The more useful you become to God, the more pleasing your life becomes to him. That's right. The more he changes you, the more useful you become. The more useful you become, the more pleasing your life becomes to him. The more pleasing your life becomes to him, the more you see his hand on your life. You recognize and see his hands on your life. First John 3, 22 says, and whatever we ask from him, we, 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 he said, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in this sight. You see that? Isn't that beautiful? I mean, what, what, what an awesome testimony to be able to have. John's like, look, we are always striving to do the things that are pleasing to him. We are soft before God. And so we are allowing him to change us, to make us what he wants us to be. And because of that, our lives become pleasing to him. And now he's shaping my heart and my mind. And everything I'm asking, he's pouring it out. Man, that's an awesome testimony to have. Besides that, trusting God, trusting God. His way, it keeps us on the right path. It keeps us on a path to positive change. Because I do believe that people change in life and not everybody changes for the good, right? You see people in, your, in, in lives, you see people grow and change and sometimes they get worse. You know, they, 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 it's, a, it's a negative change. Keeping God's word and following him, it keeps us on a path of positive change. This is what David said in Psalm 17, verse four. He said, concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept the way from the paths of the destroyer. He said, God, just by following your word, he said, it has helped to keep me away from paths that were gonna do me in because I walked the, the path of God. And what Satan wants to do, we saw it in verse nine, is that Pharaoh here, and Pharaoh uh, uh, definitely at many times represents you know, the enemy. He said, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna discourage him, I'm gonna lay heaviness on him, because I want him to stop listening to vain words. He considered the words of God to be empty words and vain words. But we know the word of God is not vain word. It is the words of life. Yeah. It's those words that when Jesus said, when all those people walked away from Jesus and Peter, he looked at him, he said, y'all going to leave too? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You got the words Lord. of eternal life. Right. And it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter how anybody else looks at the word of God. We have to cherish it. Right. We have to see it as a light and a lamp, you know, see it as a direction, as a protection. Regardless of how anybody else sees it, the call of God is challenging because it requires change and change is not always easy. We like the familiar. People don't like to change. If the thing that causes the most uh, confusion and, and, and grumbling, you know, whether it's on a job or in a city or whatever, is change. People grumble about change, even if it's for the good, they still gonna grumble about it. They fixing the hospital road, right? It's gonna be a nice, smooth road. People been grumbling, complaining. Oh, look at that road, I'll mess up with that. It's like, chill out. But that's the nature of people. We just grumble uh, because we don't like to change. We, don't, we want things to stay the same and we get comfortable with things and when it changes, it upsets us. But if we are gonna become anything that God wants us to be and have any usefulness to God, we have to change, and nobody is exempt. No one, are you hearing me? We all have to change. Jesus said, if you're gonna see the kingdom of God, if you wanna embrace him, if you're gonna see his ways, you're gonna have to be born again, and then the Bible is clear that we're gonna have to be constantly transformed and changed. It requires change, that's challenging, but you know what else it requires? A long-term commitment, not change just for a little while, a long-term commitment to being, you know, to changing and to be, being who God wants us to be. A long, see, some people can do it for a little while and do some things for a, a little short period of time. But what God calls you to, sometimes, you know, you got to understand that this is a long-term commitment to do His will. And in those particular service calls, it may be, it may be a short time, maybe a long time, you know. But you have to be in it for however long it takes. I'm going to do God's will, pressing towards the mark for a lifetime. Because what happens is that, and I used to use that uh, passage uh, that's, that uh, account from John chapter 5, when the man was at the pool of Bethesda and he'd been lying down there for 38 years. And, I, I, you know, it, it, it just kind of jumps out at me so much because this guy, they brought him there 38 years earlier before he saw Jesus. 
He made a trek. He made a journey. Because I'm going to get my healing. And he fought through different things to get over there. And once he made it there, he kind of went to a little, you know, a little funk or went to a little chill mode, which Christians do all the time, right? Pressing and, you know, man, starting to go to Bible study, trying to get my life right to the Lord. And boy, we get born again, we change, this, this, that. And we reach a certain level and then we just flatline. No more pressing. No more growth. No more passion. No more usefulness. Because God uses people with passion. Right? Like God uses those who are pressing. You don't have to be perfect, but you got to press. Right? You don't have to, you know, you can, you can, have, you can have issues that you're dealing with, but you got to have passion for the Lord. Amen? And so I want you to think about yourself, right? If I, have I just kind of leveled off and, you know, I'm good now? You know, I mean, look, hey. We, those, you got some songs that are dangerous, right? Some of you got to watch some of them songs. I ain't what I used to be. I ain't what I ought to be, but I ain't what I used to be. Say that. But you have also better include, but I ain't go, I ain't, I'm going to keep pressing until I become it. Are you with me? Because sometimes people sing those songs and make it appear that, you know, you know what? I ain't in Egypt. I mean, I ain't in the promised land, but I ain't in Egypt. But the call wasn't to go to the wilderness. The call was the promised land. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Right. And so, of course, Satan will try to want you to want you to quit. So he will. When I so when I wrote this down, I wrote that I wrote he will dis, he will try to distract and discourage you. Looking at verses eight and nine, right? He's uh, Pharaoh said, and the, and the total of bricks that they had to make is not going to diminish. We're not going to give them straw no more. They got to get their own straw, but they're still going to have to do you know the same amount of work. And that way, you know, they can forget about all of this. What God says, stuff. And so I wrote. That he will try to distract you and discourage you. And then I erased it. I said, no, I don't want to put distract. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? I, I said, I do want to say distract. That is important. And I put distract and I underlined it to make sure that I could actually highlight it. Because what Satan wants to do is to distract you. And just like he said, look, they won't listen to vain words. Distract you from the promises of God. Distract you from the call of God. Distract you from, you know, from the from the from the, the sweetness of walking with the Lord and doing his will. Distract and get you to focus on the difficulties. Yeah. Right? Distract you from, from God's call and his and his purpose and your responsibility. And now you're just focusing on the difficulties. And now that you're focusing on the difficulties, you get discouraged. So now I don't know, you know, this ain't gonna work, right? And so he wants to distract, distract you and discourage you. I think the devil banks on people, as he did with Job. He did it with Job. He banks on people forsaking God's will for their comfort. That's what he told God about Job. I said, look, he said, if you let me make Job uncomfortable, let me afflict him, he will curse you to your face. That's what, of course, Job didn't, but that's what the devil believes. Because some people do, right? Some people do sell God out for their comfort. I think Satan is banking that people are more willing to sin against God for their comfort than to be uncomfortable for his honor and glory. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? More willing to sin against him so that your friends can be all right with you, so that they won't look at you funny. So they won't talk about you. More willing to sin against God than to be uncomfortable for his honor and his glory. I got to evaluate myself in that regard. And I think you owe it to yourself to evaluate yourself in that regard also. That's why Paul told Timothy, look, you're going to walk with the Lord, you got to have a right mindset. You got to have the mindset of somebody who is at battle, of a soldier at war. When, when, when um, people enlist in the military, uh, whatever branch it is, there's a process they go to first and everybody knows it by the name of boot camp. And boot camp is to see, is to try to put you through some hard situations, some tough situations, so we can see, look, if you can't handle this, we know you might not even handle it out there in the, uh, in the real world. And so they put you through some tough things and some challenges and they screaming in your face and they dogging you out and they breaking, trying to break your, you know, you, you, you break you down as much as they can. 
because they're trying to get, get a mindset in you, a mindset that says, when the battle gets hot, I'm going to be ready. Right. And that's what Paul was trying to get through to Timothy. And he told Timothy in Second Timothy 2, 3, he says, Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship. It's a good soldier. Which also reminds me that if I don't if I if I can't remain committed and faithful to God in challenges, I'm really not a good. A good soldier. I'm really not a good soldier. This is not going overboard. He didn't say, Timothy, I need you to go overboard. He said, I just need you to be a good, a good soldier. To be able to endure the challenges. And, and the way you do that is you don't focus on the difficulty. You focus on the promises of God and the faithfulness of God. I told you when I hear those songs say he's never failed me yet. And I'm, I'm happy and I appreciate that. I'm like, you know what? But we could take that yet out of there. Because he ain't going to fail. Yes. Because the Bible is clear. Has he not said something and he won't do it? Yes. Right? That he establishes the end from the beginning. When the call of God goes forth in your life, it's not a call to say, let's see if we can do this. And God's mind is done. You just trust him. You just trust him. A long-term commitment involves, uh, uh, involves the challenge of endurance. The challenge of consistency. Right. Doing what's right for a long time, every time. And when I fail, serious repentance. All right. And, you know, and I, I think I was like, OK, I'm writing. I'm writing. And I hate to write. I hate having to write stuff like this and, and say it like you got to have sincere repentance. But, you know, the reality is that <laughs> repentance is sincere. But, you know, we got to have these qualifiers that get people to understand because there's so much of, you know, shallow stuff. You know, I ask the Lord to forgive me. You got to repent. It comes from the heart. Do you really don't? It comes from a place where I don't want this, right? I want to be free from this, God, and not because it causes me trouble, but for Your glory, for Your honor. Now, at some point in Israel's journey to the Promised Land, and that was the call, right? The call, the call to leave Egypt was not to go to the wilderness. We just mentioned that it was to go to the Promised Land, the land that flowed with milk and honey. But somewhere on their journey. To the promised land, they began to despise the process. Huh? They started grumbling. They began to despise the process that they were going through, and they began to grumble. And the thing you and I got to remember is that we can't grumble against the design without offending the designer. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That if I grumble about what I'm going through, I'm grumbling against God who is guiding my, my process. Are you with me? In other words, Romans 8.28 is always real. And we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, those who are to call according to his purpose. Therefore, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul says, In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That God has the ability in the long run, in the big scheme and scope of things, because he's God. He doesn't just control now, he controls the past, present, and the future. Yes. It is his yes. and eternity. And he says we should be people who are focused and trusting in, in him, even when we can't figure it out. You don't have to figure things out. Lord, I thank you that I have your promise. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. I thank you that even in this thing, that you will work things out in my heart, mind, and my eternity. Yes. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. God works good things out in you through the process that he ordains. Right? Now, there's a challenge to keep desiring improvement. As I said, not to get satisfied along the way. So the question is for you today is, do you want to be better? Right? Do you want to be better? Because when God calls you, you always have to improve. There's always improvement that's required to work for God. And wherever you, whatever you're doing now, whatever I'm doing now, if God calls me to something else, I'm probably going to have to get a little, there's going to have to be some change in order to do that, to go there, to meet that requirement. You got to, see, because the call of God is an upward call. 
Paul says it's, an, uh, it's a call higher. And one thing, you know, if you, you've walked up steps before, walked up a hill before, we went to Seattle and we went to, um, to this uh, waterfall, it's the uh, Snoqualmie Falls, and there was a big waterfall down there, like, you know, stuff we only saw on TV, right? And it's, you know, it's like, man, we, we're going down there. But there's a nice trek down this hill through, you know, it's winding and they got tree, tree uh, uh, roots you got to cross over. But we were going down there because, we, you know, there's a nice pool down there, a pool of water down there from the uh, waterfall. But we wanted to go down there and experience this waterfall because, you know, it's a once in a lifetime thing, thing, right? So we went down there, man. And then we went down there, we were motivated and we, it was a breeze going down there. And then after we went down, we got ready to go back up. And it was a little bit different. I wore them tennis out. I ain't wore them tennis since that day. I wore them out, uh, scraping them on the ground, and the tree uh, roots and all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? My legs were tired and stuff. It's easy, it's easy going down. But the call of God is not down. It's an upward call. You know? And so it has to be intention and challenge, right? And willing to press. Right? And maybe some scrapes and nicks and bruises along the way. But eventually we make it to the top. Are you with me? You have to want improvement. And I've said this in the past, that if somebody wants better for you than you want for yourself, there's something wrong, right? Why in the world is the pastor want better for you than you want for yourself? I want you to be strong and mighty in the Lord. You ought to, be, you ought to want at least that and more, right? The only person that should want better for you would be God himself. Are you with me? And God wants better for me than I want for myself. But then he works in me to desire his will. Isn't that beautiful? That yeah, God wants, the, he wants, the, he wants his best for you, right? His will for you is the best that could, there could be for you. And he works in you to desire that. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And he does it through the process. And so we don't need to despise that process because God, through that process, is working in us to bring about a desire for his will and actually working out of his will. And then we, when we do his will, now he's pleased with our lives. And we saw that when, he pleased, when he's pleased with our lives, he pours out blessings upon our lives. But it all started with his faithfulness. Right? It all started with what? With him working in us? Let me go back further. It all started with the call. With him calling us. Or even before that, it all goes falls, it start, all starts with him, with Christ, who was the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. It all starts with God determining to do his good will in your life before you came into this world. And we do ourselves a favor when we trust him, even when it's tough and difficult, that we make a determination that I'm going to be a good soldier and I'm going to endure whatever challenges I have to endure because I know that God is going to work about good whether I see it in life but I'm surely where I will see it in eternity. Amen? So whatever your current situation is, if you have surrendered to Christ, you can know that God is working for your good. He's working in you. He's working for you to bring about good. Don't grumble or complain. Soften yourself before him. Answer the call. And remember, it's only challenging because it's valuable. It's only challenging because it is valuable. Amen? Amen. We stop right here.